Hey guys, for those of you who are following along from the previous episode, well, welcome to part two of this Artemis special. However, for those of you who have happened to notice this video, please go back to part one, which is linked right here. Okay, in the meantime, also please subscribe. We are painfully close to 90,000, just a little over 100 subscriptions left at this point. Let's move on. So, after we've gotten everything done on the moon, which by the way, if you saw the previous episode, you know that it's going to take a series of miracles or at least significant changes in the plan in order to make all of this happen. What about going to Mars? What does NASA have in mind for the crowning achievement of this program, the whole moon to Mars endeavor? Well, you're going to find out that it's only a little less disappointing than if we canceled the whole thing. Also, as you can see here, this is a depiction from the European Space Agency of what they would like a lunar colony to look like. They have a number of designs for lunar bases, a lot of them really, really good ones, including things that are designed by respected architectural firms built into these plans or radiation shielding, in situ resource utilization, and also plans on how to deploy these bases utilizing commercial rockets. And herein lies our next problem. We haven't really planned out how we're going to integrate other national partners into this overall plan. Europe and Japan have already committed to helping out with establishing a lunar base, resupplying it, etc. And yet we don't seem to have their missions built into the framework of the plan anywhere. Why not? Why have none of these details been worked out yet, given the fact that we are now well on our way to getting the Artemis plan moving. Artemis 1 is already orbiting the moon. All of the details for the future Artemis missions need to be planned out. Now granted, they could be changed at some point, but those details just aren't there. And it makes me wonder, does NASA ever really seriously intend to get that far in this plan before it gets canceled? Now, towards the end of the sustained lunar phase, something gets added to the lunar gateway, which is very important. It's called the Transit Habitat. This is a larger space station module than has been deployed up to this point, and it's designed for long, sustained survival scenarios. In other words, it's supposed to be the core module for an Earth to Mars interplanetary spacecraft. And I'm showing you a Sierra Space Inflatable Habitat as an example of what one of these might look like because, in my opinion, that's the most efficient use of space that you can get, assuming that we don't use Starship to go from Earth to Mars, which is not built into the plan currently. NASA has not embraced Starship, so we can forget about that, at least at the moment. So they're going to add this transit habitat to the gateway, carried out simulated Mars missions inside the transit habitat and then use it as the core for an Earth to Mars spacecraft with Orion capsules added on along with a number of other modules depending on the needs of the mission. And an example of what NASA might have in mind is demonstrated here in the Lockheed Martin Mars Base Camp. Even though Starship is my preferred method of getting to Mars, I kind of like this design for a variety of different reasons. It's not really a spaceship so much as a in an interplanetary space station. It's designed in the same way that the ISS is, that the Lunar Gateway will be designed. So in other words, we're using principles that we've been practicing for a very long time out in space, and it doesn't 
require that we learn how to do much of anything new aside from propelling it from here to Mars. It contains a cryo stage for propulsion, obviously, an Orion spacecraft, which is the command and control deck for the entire spacecraft, and Orion seems to be working pretty well. It also contains its own liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen tanks, also living space for the crew, solar electric propulsion, so it has a secondary method of propulsion, which is more efficient, and also an excursion module, an airlock that is, with advanced EVA packs for exploration of low gravity bodies. And as you can see, it also has a Mars landing craft, and with the recent development of the lofted inflatable heat shield, a craft that looks like this could probably be paired off with the lofted pretty efficiently in order to make landings on the surface of Mars far more safely than something as huge as Starship. Nevertheless, this thing kind of looks like a small Starship, or maybe a small neutron rocket, actually. Nevertheless, it's not a bad plan overall, but I don't like how NASA intends to get it out into space and also to get the necessary logistics to Mars to support a Mars mission. And how are they going to do that, by the way? Well, with a hell of a lot of SLS launches. That's right, finally they're going to increase the launch cadence in order to get to Mars, how they intend to pay for that, while they're also doing sustained activities on the moon, I can't begin to guess. But nevertheless, they intend to use multiple SLS rockets in order to get the necessary logistics onto the Martian surface before we send astronauts, and that that is a problem right there. We're increasing cadence for the wrong reasons. First of all, at least according to the current plan, NASA will be using SLS in order to assemble the interplanetary vehicle. This will include, actually, either a nuclear electric or nuclear thermal propulsion system. That's right, NASA wants to use nuclear power to get to Mars because they don't like the idea of astronauts being stranded for six months in between Earth and Mars. They want to keep the transit time down to a minimum for astronauts in interplanetary space. I'm not actually really opposed to this, but of course the problem is you need an SLS in order to haul a nuclear thermal power plant out to either lunar orbit, which is where the transit stage is located, the transit habitat that is, which again, as I mentioned before, is the core portion of the interplanetary spacecraft. Is this getting complicated enough for you? And then after that, three SLS missions will be required in order to send the necessary surface logistics to Mars for the astronauts to be able to survive. This includes a power distribution system, a fission surface power plant, so another nuclear power plant, also a Mars ascent vehicle. They'll need a different vehicle in order to come back. On top of that, they're also going to need a pressurized rover. Oh, but not a surface habitat, just a pressurized rover. And the reason for that is they only only intend for two astronauts to stay on the surface of Mars for 30 days. That is another significant weakness of the plan. Not a long enough stay on the Martian surface. After all of that effort to get the astronauts to Mars, you want them to stay longer than 30 days, but that's not what they have built in to the current plan at all. The mission is supposed to take place in 2039, and it will consist of four crew, two to remain in Mars orbit and two to go to the Mars surface. Quote, this is considered to be near the lower practical limits for a mission of this complexity and length. Two crew to the surface is intended to minimize surface infrastructure and ascent mass. The approach of two crew for a surface stay is risky, but not as risky as sending two crew for the entire two-year mission. Therefore, the transit portion of the mission includes four crew, of which two stay on the ship while the other two go to the surface. Surface mission will be accomplished with no more than three 25-ton payload landers without in-situ resource utilization, so they don't seem to have that built into the plan either. It would be difficult to close the architecture for a five-sole parking orbit without creeping up above 20 tons. So it's going to be a 25-ton hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator built into the technology in order for them to safely land. So none of the stuff we're looking 
at right now is in their current plans. On top of that, the mission will not be considered successful unless the humans are returned safely. Well, that's obvious. But in addition to that, as I said before, exploring the surface for only 30 souls. Given the minimal viable architecture approach and short 30 soul surface stay, the pressurized rover volume should be sufficient for the first human mission along with allowing for expanded exploration range from the ascent element. So they're just cutting this down, shaving down this mission to the bare minimum. Can you imagine being in transit to and from Mars for a minimum of six months, and that's if you're using nuclear propulsion only to stay on the surface for 30 days? Oh, and by the way, only two people get to do that. The other two are stuck on the ship, and therein lies the most important and crowning problem with this whole plan very little return for all the effort invested. All of these SLS missions, hell, all of these years of establishing a sustained presence on the moon with the intention of sending a mission to Mars, the big crowning achievement of human exploration, and we only send two people for 30 days. Now, granted, there may be another mission in the future, but is that built into the plan? No, it isn't. And when you actually look at the details of a short stay mission, it gets really depressing. The first seven days are for crew gravity readaptation, medical operations, and IVA science. So they're just getting ready and adapted to the Martian gravity before they can even go out into the field. The only days dedicated for field exploration is souls 10 through 28, 18 days. 18 days of surface exploration in return for all of those years and all of those billions of dollars of investment. That is something that is going to generate a great deal of disappointment on Earth and a great deal of disappointment in the politicians who invested in the whole thing in the first place. By the way, this is only the top 10 problems with this plan. There are a lot of things that are very good about it, but nevertheless, given all of the weaknesses they definitely need to do some fine-tuning, and part of me really wonders if NASA actually seriously intends to carry this plan out, given all of its flaws. We are so close to 90,000 subscribers right now, guys. Please subscribe if you haven't already done so. Please check the description for various ways to support this content, and as always, stay angry about space!